Welcome to the Aircon Vault, recordings of the live streams from Airwiggles Audio Conference. These are made free thanks to our sponsors, a sound effect, Game Audio Learning, Kilohertz, Audio Kinetic, Sound Cuts, Tsugi, Boom Library, Sound Warriors, and Airwiggles, the online home for audio people. I'm Katie. Um, I'm going to do a talk on sort of the my experience and processes uh, of applying uh, for jobs in game audio. Um, based on my experience, um, but also like just very like uh, subjective, obviously, you know, um, this is just going to be my opinion, my experience, but also giving a bit of insight into um, sort of where I work at Rare and what our application process is like, focusing largely on our internship, uh, which we just completed sort of um, a fresh round of uh, applications for uh, for this year. Uh, so just an introduction. Uh, so my name is Katie Tarrant. Uh, some of you may know me, uh, a lot of you probably don't, um, but I'm a senior sound designer at Rare and I started as an audio intern there uh, in 2017. So my background is that I'm a musician, I'm a guitarist and uh, I went to university um, to study music. I didn't know anything about game audio uh, when I went to university. So I studied in Liverpool at the Liverpool Institute for Performing Arts and my goal was always to be a session guitarist and to just play in bands. That was always what I'd done. And that was kind of my only um, my only perception of what a career in music was back then. Um, that was kind of like, OK, well, I'm a musician. I guess I'll go and play music as a, as a, as a job. I didn't really kind of think there was anything else out there that I could do for a living at that time, apart from maybe teaching music. Um, so my, my course kind of covered all sorts of things like composition, uh, production, um, you know, managing your own career, your accounts and everything like that. And it wasn't until I hit the kind of composition module um, that I fell in love with that, of composing music. I was like, wow, this is awesome. Um, and I started, you know, as as most composers kind of do with a more linear style of composing for, for small uh, uh, film projects and things like that. And um, yeah, I, I just really fell in love with that. And as, as I was kind of composing um, and getting more into that, learning a bit more about what styles of music I liked and sort of a little bit more about um, using an audio workstation and VSTs and stuff like that, um, I kind of realised that in my spare time I was always playing games and games have music, you know, and I started to really tune into what game music sounded like and, and what soundtracks were on the games that I was playing um, and just trying to learn a bit more about that. And um you know, I started reaching out to some people that, uh, you know, a, a good uh, friend of mine on my course that was uh, already kind of delving into sound design and, and game audio. We chatted more and more. And so I sort of started just kind of branching out into what game music was, what game audio was, what what's the community like, that sort of thing. Um, so I kind of just really immersed myself in game audio over over the last couple of years of my degree. My final portfolio was just a compilation of, of sort of game compositions that I'd written or things where I'd kind of set myself a brief of like, okay, I'm going to try and write like a bit of menu music for a horror game or something like that. You know, my, my final project was like an hour of sort of different tracks that I'd, I'd written uh, for various little kind of design briefs that I'd given myself. Um, and then after I graduated, I kind of had uh, maybe a year or so of like uh, going out, networking, uh, going to events and doing small, very small sort of freelance projects, doing a lot of game jams, which I'll talk about later before eventually applying for this internship, um, which I was uh, super lucky to get. And um, yeah, I will talk a little bit more about what that internship entailed. Um, but initially, I just want to kind of talk a bit about expectation versus reality in terms of getting into the industry. Um, and just a few kind of common expectations that I've seen in sort of, um, you know, various people that I've spoken to. Um, so just a few that I want to go over, the idea of getting the first job that you're going to apply for or that your degree has taught you absolutely everything that you need to know. You can apply for something without any form of showreel or portfolio. You don't need to network or you don't need to bother with social media uh, versus the reality. The reality being that you will likely have to apply for it one, if not some, if not many jobs before having success. And that's completely normal. Um, you'll never stop learning. Like a degree is a fantastic foundation, but... It's not necessary these days. Uh, I'll go into that a bit more later, but, you know, you can teach yourself a lot uh, and degrees are absolutely fantastic. And there are so many good uh, audio and sound design and composition courses out there now and game specific courses, which they've kind of cropped up a lot more over sort of since I studied, uh, which is really nice to see. But you can also teach yourself a lot as well. Um, 
you're almost always going to need uh, a showreel or portfolio for any job that you apply for, because ultimately um, an employee needs to be able to see what kind of skill level you're at, uh, what what the style of your audio, or your sound design or your music is like, etc. cetera. Um, networking isn't an essential thing, but uh, it's a core part of sort of building a name for yourself in the industry. The more people that you know, um, the more kind of connections you'll make, friendships you'll make. I'll talk a bit more about networking later as well, um, but sort of you're, you're if you build your network, you know, the more well known you become and sort of that can lead to freelance work and that sort of thing. Um, and social media, again, it's not everything. Like, I think a lot of us kind of prefer to unplug from social media where we can, but it's a really valuable way of kind of just getting yourself out there. Um, not only kind of promoting what you do, uh, but also just making friends and sort of uh, just building connections. Um, so just a bit more about expectations. Um, the game audio industry, as uh, some or many of you may already know, is highly competitive. Um, it's currently quite volatile. You know, there's been a lot of layoffs across the industry, um, some affecting audio, some not. But, you know, it kind of feels like there's not necessarily a, a solid safe space at the moment. You know, like it, it kind of feels like even people that seem like they're doing well are still getting hit with layoffs. You know, so it's, it's quite a kind of... Um, yeah, kind of a scary time at the moment, to be honest. Um, everyone's path into the industry is different. Um, and that's kind of, I think, an important thing to always remember is that the way that you get onto, into the industry um, might be completely different uh, and probably will be completely different to, to the other people that you know. And it can be easy to compare yourself to someone and see them doing things a certain way or having success in a certain way. And you're not having success in that way and kind of wondering why. But everyone's path can be totally different. I know plenty of people that have gone into the industry through the traditional application process of applying for a job, but plenty of people that have gone in through the people that they know. Um, not all kind of job applications are even posted online. Sometimes there's kind of an internal hiring process that's kind of just with recommendations or sort of through the people that those hiring actually know already. Um, it can take time. You know, patience is absolutely key. Um, and the bar for entry can obviously be quite high as well, especially because there's so many fantastic resources out there and also courses. It's great to see that the strength of candidates is getting stronger every year, but obviously that makes it so much harder. Um, you know, when I see some candidates, even that we've had in, in the last year for our internship, like it's incredible what people know uh, when applying even for a, an entry level job now. And we still take that into consideration because ultimately we're still looking for someone that is entry level. We're not looking to take on someone that kind of essentially knows too much or already is clearly capable of moving into a higher level role. Um, but yeah, the bar for entry, even for for, for entry level can can be quite high nowadays. Um and again, I'll talk a bit more about this later, but the idea of working freelance before you work in-house, that, that is the reality for quite a lot of people. Even for me, it wasn't for very long, maybe only a year, but I did work freelance before I worked uh, in-house. And the experience that I got from that was really valuable when it came to sort of eventually working in-house and applying for an in-house role. And job hunting can be really stressful and really overwhelming. And I think it's, it's a really hard realisation that you can have where you kind of discover game audio as a career path and you think, oh, my God, this is amazing. This is like my dream job. I would love to do this for a career. Uh, and it is it, it is a valid and potential career path that you can embark on. And you get that excitement, that ambition. You really just want to get going and kind of get into the industry and get out there. Um, and you might start teaching yourself a whole bunch of stuff or you might embark on a course or a degree. And then you kind of just get stuck in your tracks or, or stopped in your tracks when you when you realize it's actually quite challenging to get into and that. You might go through a whole bunch of applications for different job roles or there might not even be any job roles to apply for. And that can be really kind of damaging to your motivation and your self-esteem sort of knocks the wind out of your sails. And I kind of just want to talk a bit more about the best ways that you can kind of be preparing, the best ways that you can try and motivate yourself and just things that you can be doing that aren't necessarily sitting behind your PC and, and creating audio, but actually just kind of getting out there, making friendships, connecting with people, be it in person, virtually uh, and so on. So a bit about what we'll cover. Um, this talk will focus largely on entry level job applications, um, largely because I feel that's actually one of the most important applications that you will need to make in your career. Um, and again, this could be an actual physical application to a, a, a job role, um, or it could even be the kind of word of mouth application that you meet, you make through the people that you meet and kind of building your network and the, and the way that freelancing kind of works uh, with sort of who you know. But you know, your your entry level job or your first job is what gets you in the door. It's what gets the ball rolling. It's what gets the, the, the foundation of your portfolio kind of set. 
Um, and once you're in the industry, like your skill set will rapidly develop once you're getting uh, either regular jobs in on a freelance basis or once you're working in house, like you're getting that daily work experience, you're meeting people, you're hopefully gaining credits for any projects that you're shipping. Um, that's going to kind of build the basis of any future applications or any future kind of word of mouth networking, building that reputation that you're going to make uh, for the rest of your career, sort of mid-level, senior and beyond. So really that that kind of entry level position or that junior position, that graduate position is, is probably one of the most important um, it, that you're going to make in, in your career. So I feel like being prepared for that and kind of trying to share as much information on that to people. Like I'm, I'm really passionate about trying to help people that are in that kind of entry level bubble, not only because it's most relevant to, to me and my experience so far with the journey that I've been on with sort of uni to internship and beyond, um, but just because I feel like that's such a kind of core and pivotal moment in, in people's careers, like to kind of try and provide support. Um, and it's, you know, it's a whole other discussion that I wish that there were more entry level roles out there uh, that people could be applying for. I wish that I could be, you know, kind of giving a huge list of, of jobs out there that are kind of ready to apply for. But that's unfortunately not the case. But when they do come along, like being as prepared as possible um, is, is kind of the key. Um, and you know, obviously at entry level, you don't really know many people in the industry yet. You're not going to have any project credits. You may have only just made your first ever showreel. Um, so you might not really have any development experience. So it's kind of talking a bit about how do you stand out uh, when you don't have a lot of that stuff as well. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about job specs, like job spe specifications, um, your CV and your cover letter, your showreel. Um, common mistakes that I've seen sort of in, in, in my uh, hiring experience so far. Uh, interviews, uh, networking and freelance work. Um, and I just want to say that obviously everything in this presentation, like it's my opinion, it's my experience. Like this isn't like definitive, like do this and you will get a job in the industry. It's just do this and you will hopefully have better chances or you'll hopefully stand out a bit more in your next kind of uh, application uh, for, for your next job or things that you could maybe be keeping in mind when you're sort of getting out there networking, that kind of thing. Uh, so a bit about the Rare Audio internship, uh, which again, some of you may may have heard of, some of you might not have. Um, so at Rare, uh, we offer a 12 month paid internship, uh, which I think is a fantastic opportunity. It's a really uh, long internship. You know, you work with us for an entire year. Um, and we aim to in hire an intern every year. And unfortunately, COVID threw a bit of a spanner in the works with this. We haven't taken on an intern for a few years, uh, but we are taking on an intern this year. We're all incredibly excited about that. Um, and it's it's a really valuable kind of um, opportunity. And I love that we kind of uh, try and provide this wherever we can, uh, because so far um, half of our team are kind of ex interns, uh, that being me and two of my colleagues. Uh, we all did the internship and kind of got kept on afterwards. Um, and the other person that kind of did an audio internship at Rare uh, went on to uh, work at Frontier and has kind of moved on since then. Um, but yeah, the internship has basically a great track record of getting someone in into the door when they've got really limited experience and then landing them in sort of full-time work and ultimately, you know, into now pretty much uh, mid-level, senior level, which is where we're all at at the moment. Um, a little bit kind of like I just wanted to mention about intern versus graduate versus junior is like you may see these kind of terms thrown about, like um, they can mean different things at different companies, um, but at least for us, like uh, an intern will be someone coming on that um, has some experience in audio. And I will talk a bit more about the the job specifications for the internship, but someone coming on that has some experience in audio, uh, but it's still very, very early on in their career path. So they may not have done any kind of um, official work on any projects yet. They, they wouldn't have necessarily worked with any companies or anything like that. Uh, they may not have even worked with any kind of individuals. Um, they may have just come out of university or still be studying in university or kind of just be teaching themselves. Um, whereas a graduate or a junior would be more someone that um, already has a little bit of experience and is coming on more with the ability to be able to do the job at a junior level from the get-go rather than someone that's coming on and sort of may need teaching about the basics of wise for example um, or something like that like for a, for a junior uh, level we would be expecting someone to know a little bit more but for intern and graduate you know they're kind of um, you know the, the, the bar's a, a little bit lower shall we say. Uh, so a bit about job specs, because they, they can be a minefield. And luckily, over the past few years, like I've noticed a bit of an improvement in this, but sort of the clarity over job specifications. Um, 
you know, and they, it can seem a little bit overwhelming sometimes when you read like a job uh, application and the sort of things that get asked for sometimes. Um, and there were instances in the past where even an intern uh, or a junior level, uh, they were already expecting you to have multiple years in the industry or having already shipped a project. And you kind of you end up in that vicious loop of just like, well, how can I get a job in uh, in an internship or a junior role with a project experience if I haven't? been given the project experience in the first place you know the entry level is meant to be your step into getting the project experience so thankfully i have noticed that job specs seem to be a little bit more realistic nowadays for this um but overall i tend to always take job specifications with a bit of a pinch of salt they're a good guideline for what a company is looking for for a, an applicant but they're not necessarily requirements that are set in stone and i mean this more from the point of view of things like um years of experience you know an application, not necessarily for entry level, but beyond may specify a set number of years of experience. But just because a job spec that says, you know, you need more than three years of experience and you've maybe only got two years of experience, don't necessarily let that put you off of applying because it's not it's not a case of that they're going to take not take the better candidate just because they've got uh, a year less of experience, for example, you know, ultimately. Um, if you've got like four years instead of five or two years instead of three, or you've only shipped one project instead of two projects, still consider applying because you, you will potentially still be considered for that role uh, based on sort of how strong your application is. Uh, number of credits, you know, I've kind of already mentioned that, you know, whether you ship one project instead of two, or maybe you've not actually shipped any, but you still have, you feel that you've got enough relevant experience or you've worked uh, freelance, you know, with independent developers, you've worked on smaller projects, but not necessarily AAA, that kind of thing. Sometimes enough of that experience is still transferable that a company will still consider you uh, for the role. Um, a diploma or degree, this again is also becoming less relevant nowadays. I see it listed less and less on job applications, um, but, your degree is only as valuable as the experience that it brings you. So having a, a degree certificate isn't necessarily going to give you sort of a door into the industry. Um, it really is only worth what you've learned from that degree and what you what kind of experience and knowledge you're bringing forward to that role. Um, so, again, we've done we used to have a requirement for the internship where you had to be uh, studying or you had to have just finished studying. But we've kind of removed that requirement now because we're just interested in taking on anyone that is at the entry level role, regardless of whether they've studied on an official basis, because, especially because you can teach yourself uh, so much nowadays as well. And things like programming experience as well. That gets mentioned a lot on applications like having uh, C++ or scripting knowledge. It is generally mentioned in like a nice to have or like a desirable uh, kind of thing. Um, but ultimately, like I always get asked a lot, like whether programming experience is necessary. And in my opinion, like you should never focus on learning programming before you focus on obviously building your, your audio knowledge and your audio experience. Um, because ultimately, like programming is great. I actually do quite a lot of that now, but that's something that I've learned much further on in my career rather than worrying about doing that at the point at which I was literally trying to learn how to write music or how to write sound as, uh, how to do sound design at a very basic level um, and when you're starting out there's already so much to learn so your focus should always be on you know the core thing that you actually want to do for your job um, and like I say you can always sort of learn programming later later down the line if you want to um, and I think also it's kind of important to mention that if you're struggling to kind of get job roles at sort of a graduate or a junior level, um, don't kind of give up entirely. Just kind of keep learning and keep growing because you might be able to build up to, to sort of um, a, a slightly higher job level. Like perhaps you, you're you at a junior level now. Maybe you've got a bit of project experience or maybe you've done quite a lot of freelance work, um, but you can kind of keep building on your knowledge. And maybe you're able to get more towards a sort of a low mid-level kind of role. Or maybe you can then apply for a kind of broader spectrum of roles that are available rather than just having to sort of uh, focus on the junior level. So never kind of just sit there stagnating just because the jobs aren't there. Kind of just just keep building on your knowledge and hopefully you know you can you can broaden that sort of spectrum of, of stuff that you, you can apply for and opportunities so just a bit about the the job spec for our internship so um i'm just going to put this in the actual like copy pasted from what word for word because i want to talk a little bit about the the phrasing um and sort of uh, a little bit of clarity over what our job spec actually is and hopefully some of 
shedding light on a bit of this will hopefully be transferable to some other job applications that you might read for, for other roles and other companies. Um, but experience of producing audio and a passion for the technology of state of the art ordering, audio authoring techniques. So basically that you've just got experience creating sounds um, or writing music. You're familiar with audio workstations. You've maybe dabbled with a few plugins, that sort of thing. Like you've, you've got sort of a, at least uh, some basic experience in, in doing, you know, the, the thing that you are applying for, be it a sound design or, or a music internship. Um, a solid grounding in core audio foundation and a genuine enthusiasm for sonics and current as well as future audio creation techniques. So this essentially just means having a good ear for audio um, and having a good ear can be an instinctive thing for some people, but it is something that can also develop over time. Practicing critical listening, you know, kind of studying the games that you're playing, listening to the, the music and the sound design, experimenting with your own asset creation and mixing and stuff like that. Uh, that's all kind of going to build on that, that kind of solid grounding uh, in audio uh, and building your, your kind of ear for it. Um, Next one being a portfolio or a technical blog uh, demonstrating your ability in audio, music and or implementation. And we say portfolio or technical blog because um, we do sometimes have people apply that are purely interested in technical sound design. Uh, and so their portfolio might be more focused on implementation and sort of demonstrating the audio systems that they've created uh, rather than a showreel uh, specifically on sort of more linear sound design or sort of interactive sound design or like audio assets that they've created. Um, you know, so that sometimes um, we, you know, we'll find people that have, have one or the other. Uh, sometimes we find people that have both, you know, like people that, are interested in both sides they might have um an audio showreel but then they might also have like a technical showreel as well of just things that they've been dabbling in in sort of a unreal engine or, or wires that kind of thing um a good understanding with audio doors. So we don't have any requirements of what one that you use uh, at Rare um, kind of specifically. Uh, so just any experience in any any door of your choice uh, and also with audio middleware. Again, we use WISE, um, so for us, obviously, we would prefer that you've got experience in WISE, at least to a basic degree, um, you know, and I mean as much as like just going through the documentation or sort of the, the videos that are available on Audio Kinetics website, you know, not necessarily being an expert, like it's just, again, this is this is very entry level. Um, but if you've only ever used FMOD, that's absolutely fine. You know, ultimately the, the philosophy, the logic, you know, a lot of it's transferable. It's kind of just about, um, you know, the ins and outs of using the software itself, like we can teach that to you uh, if necessary. Um, so a profit, I want to then, this is going from sort of um, required in experience into desirable experience. And I kind of just want to talk a bit about the difference with that as well. So here we have uh, proficiency with audio doors and audio middleware. So that kind of is just separating it from you've got opened wires and maybe kind of just learned the names of the different containers, but, you know, actually being competent with using it, maybe you've made a small system in it, or maybe you've um, downloaded Unreal Engine and actually connected the two and done a little demo project, that kind of thing. Um, these are sort of some of the things that might stand out in terms of someone showing their, their proficiency with, with using that software. So it's kind of um, having more experience with it rather than kind of uh, having just done the very basics, but, um, you know, how much time have you spent using that software? Um, maybe you've got experience using mo multiple different audio workstations instead of just one, um, or maybe you've worked on some more complex projects. Maybe you've got a deeper understanding of uh, using plugins and processing. Maybe you've even dabbled in a bit of scripting for Reaper, that kind of thing. Um, it's more just about kind of uh, time spent and, and the time that you've been able to invest in, in kind of learning those tools. Uh, and uh, same goes really for the engines and editors like Unreal Engine, Unity, etc. Um, a good ear for making high quality sounds like this is part of our core belief at Rare, and I'm sure it is at most audio teams at most companies. But everything technical can be taught, um, and you but you can give someone feedback on their sound design or their music, um, but you can't necessarily train them to develop a good ear in the sense of a good ear comes from your own personal time spent listening to things, critically listening to things, kind of learning your your taste, your perspective, um, understanding how your brain and your ears perceive frequencies, perceive sounds, you know, what you enjoy listening to, what you don't, uh, how you like kind of balancing things and mixing things, you know, all of that just kind of comes out of your personal experience. And we can kind of work with you on building that, but ultimately the building of that has to be done by you. So kind of having a good ear 
when you've got a bit more experience in audio, like that is something that will develop. And you can hear when you listen to a showreel, for example, you can already get a sense of whether that person has got a good ear for audio. You know, there, there are details that you'll be able to point out and, and notice that you're like, yeah, OK, that um, they've got a good ear for it. You know, uh, it's kind of a bit of an instinctive thing. So um, a deep understanding of how audio for games is authored and like also how it differs from linear media, like. I say deep understanding, but, you know, basically just understanding the difference between um, how linear kind of audio works versus how interactive audio works. And that's, you know, the basics of using middleware and just being familiar with what the game development process is in terms of like um, not necessarily having experience like working on a game, but even just like having listened to some interviews or some podcasts, read some articles, learned about some behind the scenes of sort of what processes have been for other people, uh, what kind of middleware options are out there, what audio engines are out there, what game engines are out there, that kind of thing. Um, just kind of having a bit of a, a I, say, I think it would be better to just not necessarily say deep because it doesn't have to be detailed, but just an understanding, um, you know, but obviously the deeper that understanding is, the more desirable that is because, you know, that's it's kind of just shows that you've spent time teaching yourself and learning that kind of thing. Um, so, yeah. Next one being uh, audio interests outside of those prescribed at uni. So basically people that show that they've um they've maybe done some game jams or they've maybe worked on like a small game project either by themselves or with someone else maybe they've gotten into a bit of like a modding community on a certain game or they've taken part in like audio challenges like air wiggles being a great example if you've done the sound design challenges through air wiggles that kind of thing anything that just shows that you're you're just going you know a bit broader with kind of the things that you're learning and, and spending a bit more time um Recording experience, like, again, this is a plus. This can just be as simple as, as using your handheld, although it kind of mentions, like, microphone selection and placement. Like, that's – it's very vague, you know, really. It's just about any recording experience that you've got. Um, understanding of workflow, getting sounds to trigger sort of in a game engine, and that – you can learn some of that from basically just getting a demo project downloaded and just experimenting with connecting it to wires, that kind of thing. Um, you can you can learn quite a lot about that, that workflow, um, even just messing around with a bit of Unreal Blueprint to kind of trigger sounds in different ways, that sort of thing. Um, and experience in any of the game development mentioned. So obviously I haven't got the whole um, the whole job spec here uh, in terms of some of the other stuff. But, you know, we mentioned things about the uh, what an intern will do at Rare and kind of working with other departments, uh, problem solving the workflow, our workflow style, that kind of thing. So if you've got experience of having already worked maybe with artists or environment artists or a programmer, that kind of thing, that's all sort of relevant. Uh, so just a bit about the application guidelines, like we mentioned like including uh, a copy of your CV and your cover letter um, and a little bit that we mentioned about things to stand out, like including basically things that you're really proud of, like your best work sort of thing. Like this is your one chance to show us what you're made of. So, you know, um, that just putting in what, what you kind of your proudest, your proudest stuff so far or your, your strongest work so far. Um, and also just mentioning like why you want to work for our team at Rare. Like some people kind of get a bit creative with their applications. Um, you know, we had some people make like a little game, um, a game demo, like a playable sort of game level. And like they had sort of their, their information kind of placed out in the level that like their CV information and stuff or like other people that, um, you know, just get a little bit more, um, you know, not necessarily they have their showreel, but, you know, not necessarily just like their showreel on their application, but, you know, just sort of experimenting with that a little bit. But it's really not necessity but it's just something that you know is maybe a little bit more um stands out a little bit more from the rest uh, so just a bit about our process um so overall we had 254 applications for the internship um and we divided that across the team because we wanted to ensure that every application was given as much time and consideration as possible um so we all kind of took took our chunk of the applications went through them um, and we went through CVs, cover letters, uh, show reels, um, sometimes multiple times. You know, we really uh, went on people's websites if they had game projects they wanted us to look at. You know, we kind of looked at absolutely everything that we could. Um, and then 
out of the ones that we each looked at, we provided our short list of candidates, which was roughly about 10 people. So between sort of the five of us from the team that, that split the applications, uh, we reviewed those 50 together in a room. So we kind of went into our studio for a few days and we went through all of those applications again, like the 50 that we'd shortlisted, going back through websites, back through CVs, cover letters, showreels, et cetera. Um, and we discussed them, you know, what we felt about each one and what we felt came across well, et cetera. And then we shortlisted did that uh, sort of as a joint agreement down to 10 people and those 10 people then got a uh, team's interview so that was a virtual interview with uh, our audio director and our music director um, John and Robin so they then had that initial kind of uh, get to know someone ask a few questions ask about why they want to apply for the internship that kind of thing um, and then that was then shortlisted uh, down to five and those five then came on site for interviews in person with with the whole team basically so they they would start their interview chatting to john and then they got to meet the rest of the team and then we kind of just had a bit of a round table kind of conversation and asking different questions that sort of thing and then from that we chose our final candidate so a bit about a few common mistakes that kind of came up throughout the application process like no showreel like ultimately no showreel we can't hear what you're capable of um and like a showreel is really important because that's the only way that we can understand your ear for audio what your experience level is so far your attention to detail what your interests are what kind of style of sound design or music that you might have that sort of thing and so without a showreel like we can't accept an application so unfortunately it does get discarded uh, broken links, um, that is surprisingly common, like people that kind of have submitted a link that doesn't go anywhere or it's, it's a dead link, it's a dead end. Um, but even though we had a lot of applications to go through and there were quite a few that had broken links, we did actually take the time to reach out to those people individually um, to give them a chance to resubmit that link so that we could review it properly. And most of them did. So, um, yeah, had they not replied again, that application would have unfortunately been discarded. Um, Another one was wrong company name on the cover letter. Like it's understandable that obviously people might be out there applying for lots of different jobs um, and mistakes do happen. But uh, the wrong company name not only kind of highlights that you very much just copy pasted that entire cover letter from another application. And again, it's fine if you need to copy paste some information, if you want to kind of if you feel that information in your cover letter is relevant to multiple companies. Um, but it kind of does show a bit of a lack of care and attention to detail if you've not made the time to reread through your cover letter, make sure that you've put the correct information in um, and that you're actually addressing it to the people that you're sending it to. Um, and no mention of why they were applying. You know, we had some applications that if you looked at it, you wouldn't really know that it was an application for an audio internship. It was very vague. Um, it didn't really explain sort of uh, anything about why they wanted to apply for the job, uh, what they felt they would gain out of the internship, etc. So this isn't something that we would necessarily have discarded an application for. Obviously, we still go through the showreel, the website, etc. Um, but yeah, it's kind of helps us to get a bit of a sense of why you're actually applying for the job in the first place. Um, but things that stood out at the application stages, a strong showreel, like well mixed, good sound design, attention to detail, uh, stuff that's context appropriate, um, but also um, a unique showreel as well, um, purely because it didn't necessarily matter if it was the strongest in terms of its sound design, but if there was a unique choice of clips or like unique stylistic choices or interesting genres or a style of sound design that we hadn't really seen, that still stood out. Uh, even if it wasn't the strongest sound design, like having something that was a little bit more unique uh, was still stood out uh, to us amongst the rest. Um, Relevant experience, like uh, any self-taught skills that people had, like I mentioned a bit before about people that might have um, spent time sort of uh, learning wires or learning Unreal Engine or sort of connecting the two, making a little demo project, uh, participating in a game jam, that kind of thing. Uh, anything that they've kind of done to, to uh, teach themselves what they can. Well written cover letters, like a cover letter really is kind of a mini interview introduction. So anything that kind of... Um, it covered a bit about who they were, but also their background, their experience. But as I mentioned in the previous slide, like why they were applying, why they wanted the internship, what they felt that they would get out of it, what that they felt they could bring to the company and, and to the job, etc. Um, and extracurricular learning and activities like so I, I, I mentioned before, like a sort of game jams or, or demo projects that they might have um, they, they might have been uh, part of. So interview stages. Uh, 
communication with the team, obviously, like being able to get on with the team uh, from the get go. You know, that's always a strong indicator that someone will be a good fit culturally if we already s kind of um, get on well and can hold a conversation well and they kind of uh, seem sort of uh, relaxed enough, comfortable enough and they feel like they get on with with all of us as, as people. Um, being able to talk in more detail about their knowledge and their experience, you know, but uh, it's not necessarily about how much that knowledge they have at the time, um, but uh, what they've been doing to learn, uh, their motivation, their enthusiasm, that kind of thing, that all comes across in the way that they present themselves. Um, good answers on why they want the internship, but also what their future ambitions and goals are. Like, what do they want to learn while they're with us? What do they feel that we can do for them? Like the internship is as much for them as it is for us. Like we're there to kind of help you learn and to support you on your journey. So when I interviewed, I said that my, basically all my experience was in composition, but I also wanted to dabble in a bit of sound design. And now I'm a senior sound designer. So you can see that obviously that journey went off in a completely different direction. You know, I ended up falling in love with sound design and that was, that was where I went afterwards. So um, yeah, but also talking about things like relocation, like is someone willing to relocate for the job, that kind of thing. How do they feel about that? Um, all of those sorts of things. So a bit about my cover letter, like um, my cover and my application in general, like my cover letter sort of uh, and what I felt kind of worked for me, at least, and what I've learned from since from the team and from my boss about what he felt stood out uh, at the time. So my cover letter sort of covered what I wanted to gain out of the internship, what I felt I could bring to the team, uh, what I'd been doing so far, like any extra extracurricular stuff, like events I've been to or anything, you know, just things that showed that I was really kind of just immersed in game audio and like doing absolutely everything that I could to get in. And the in internship was then kind of just their helping hand to be like, cool, OK, like that's the that's the step in the door. Um, I'd written music for several small projects, uh, both film and sort of game related and also participated in sort of game jams and stuff. I'd done quite a big push on self teaching what I could uh, from online documentation, uh, videos, you know, I was listening to interviews, podcasts, kind of just absorbing, being a knowledge sponge, basically just absorbing everything I could, both from online resources, but also from talking to people, getting asking questions, getting feedback, that kind of thing. Um, I did a little Twitch channel, like composing music so that they could see like a little bit about my composing process. And, um, you know, I had like a little community of folks that would listen and give feedback and, and chat to me while I was writing music. It was kind of just like a bit of company while I was composing, which I really enjoyed. And that was like, again, like a little extracurricular thing that just showed them that I was how how enthusiastic and, and, and I was about kind of writing music in my spare time and wanting to sort of give stuff back to people and, and learn. Uh, I was writing for an audio website called The Sound Architect at the time. So I was doing film reviews, game reviews. That was really good for my critical listening um, because I was kind of analysing and reviewing a lot of games and, and products and stuff. Um, but I also did event reviews, so that was really good for networking. Uh, I was fortunate enough to win a scholarship to go to GDC, so that was incredible, and uh, also got a, um, a Graduate Musician Award. And both of those kind of just showed that uh, it was a bit of recognition that I'd received for the hard work that I'd been doing and kind of just um, just showed that I kind of gone a little bit over and above, like um, with seeking out opportunities and again, just trying to trying to find like any avenue that I could to sort of uh, work my way into the industry. And my interview, like my interview, both of them seemed to go well. Um, and I got on really well with the audio and music directors like in the first interview and then I seemed to get on really well with the rest of the team so I think you know that positive experience of the the interview going well um, all of that combined kind of um, in their opinion you like must have led to a, a good application because I ended up getting the job so a bit about showreels so uh, just in again this is my opinion but what I feel kind of works best for showreels so in terms of length like 60 to 90 seconds nothing too short nothing too long um, and sort of just a variety of um, of clips but putting your best work first so the clips that you're strongest uh, you're, you're most proud of like your strongest clips that showcase your best sound design that sort of thing always go in kind of the chronological order of like here's either my most recent or my strongest uh, or my best work and then kind of go from there um, roughly maybe four to five clips of different styles, like demonstrating various areas of sound design. You know, I see a lot of the same clips in different showreels and that's fine. Um, but obviously, you know, if I've seen that clip sort of 25, 30 times, you have to have done a really good job for it to then stand out in my memory of the other 25, 30 times that I've seen it. Whereas if you do something that's more unique or isn't seen in a lot of showreels, um, if it sounds good, obviously, then I'm, that's going to be more memorable for me because not only that it sounds good, but it's also something that I've not seen very often or, or heard very often. It's a new take on something uh, that I've not seen yet, so which is which is great. Um, so uh, 
yeah, I mentioned uh, about that, just going, making sure that I'm thinking of my notes. Uh, variety, that's a key thing as well, is um, making sure that you demonstrate a bit of variety in the stuff that you've done. Uh, this can depend on the job that you're applying for. Like maybe you're applying specifically for a job, uh, a company that's working on a first person shooter and you want your showreel to just be all first person shooters. That's absolutely fine. Um, but if you're applying for sort of various jobs and having a showreel that has a bit more versatility to it uh, is good. All, also for kind of showcasing, um, you know, the versatility in your sound design, but also just makes your show a bit more relevant to different jobs that you might be applying for, different projects, that kind of thing. Um, creative versus technical, like I would say, consider reserving any technical clips or sort of walkthroughs that you might have of little demo projects that you've done, that kind of thing, um, to a separate reel, basically, like just a separate bit on your website or a separate reel on, on YouTube, you know, just so that um, you can have your one show reel focus more on your, your creative and your sound design or your music, and then something that focuses a little bit more on your implementation separately. Um, and sound over visuals, I say this more because I see a lot of people worrying about kind of the visual flow and the edit of your clips, and that's absolutely fine. But I think always prioritise more how good your sound design is and sort of make sure all of those clips stand well in isolation rather than worrying about kind of how snappy the edit is between them. Because I think sometimes focusing more on the visual edit, people end up choosing clips that are less desirable uh, or they or they only show like a really specific part of a clip just because the end of it kind of transitions into the next clip. Like focus more on whether it sounds good and, and just creating good sound design for those clips rather than, you know, about nailing down like a really cinematic sort of uh, edit together. Um, use your showreel as an opportunity to learn, like let the, let the process be exciting, you know, choose clips that you're excited about making the sounds for, spend some time delving into your plugins if you've got them, you know, uh, experiment with different ideas, maybe go and record some of your, your own sounds, like just enjoy that full creative process um, and get feedback wherever possible. Like there's so many great communities for audio out there now. So websites like Airwiggles, you can use LinkedIn, um, there's Twitter or X as it's now called, you know, they're great places to like try and get feedback from people, um, share your reel um, and give you a bit of point of connection. Maybe you meet some other people that are also working on their reel or maybe they've got some questions, you know, it's a really nice kind of point of connection with different people. Um, and yeah, there's also things like Discord, like um, uh, I use the sort of game audio Slack uh, back when I was starting out. Um, the real talk from uh, Power. I think someone's just mentioned that in the chat, actually. So I've not been reading the chat as much. I will answer questions at the end. But yeah, real talk from Power Up Audio. That's great. And I, I also applied for that when I was starting out and I got some really valuable feedback back then as well. So there's lots of resources out there for, for getting feedback and kind of growing that. Um, so a bit about CV and cover letter, like ideally one, two pages max, you know, keep it concise, keep it relevant to, to, to your relevant experience um, and covering sort of like... Um, you know, like um, ideally, if you've got any audio relevant experience, you know, then that's great. Kind of highlight that a little bit. It doesn't matter whether it's, you know, obviously employed experience I'm talking about for, for our internship and for entry level. But, you know, anything that is you feel is sort of relevant in, in the audio kind of um, category. Um, ideally, um, avoiding skill charts as well. Um, actually, I'm going to say things to include and then things to avoid. That would be a better way of doing it. So, um, yeah, anything that you've done about that's relevant to audio or to game development, like uh, we've already talked a bit about sort of like maybe um, any projects that you've done, game jams that you've done, any if you've done any freelance work, that's great. Um, talking about your soft skills as well. Like I find a lot of people don't really mention their soft skills. So whether they feel like they, um, they're good at communication or whether they're good at teamwork, uh, whether whether they take feedback on well, whether they're good at troubleshooting problems, uh, whether they've got good initiative, uh, any of those kinds of things, really, that kind of um, it's not just about your technical ability, but it's about how you are as a person as well. And like how you are with the team, uh, how you are sort of, um, you know, how you feel about working in house with 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 a team and with with like kind of in a studio capacity. Um, but things to avoid, like uh, I, I personally don't like seeing skill charts or like representing your skills as any sort of definitive level or value, you know, basically suggesting that you're 75% of your way through learning Pro Tools, for example, like what does that mean? You know, what what is that that chart? What is that skill? What's the point of reference there? You know, we never stop learning about anything. So I always like to kind of see that someone recognizes what they know so far, but then also recognizes the growth that they've still got to do in, in that kind of uh, area. So um, and I want to talk a bit about uh, freelancing because I feel like when you haven't got a lot of job opportunities to apply for, like what can you be doing basically in your spare time? Um, to 
to basically like be be trying to get into the industry you know what can you be doing to be getting audio experience what can you be doing um basically just instead of sitting there twiddling your thumbs waiting for the next job role to pop up like what else can you be doing so obviously like as a lot of you may already know like entry level opportunities and audio opportunities in general can be few and far between and even the applications that you make to those roles won't necessarily be successful so the industry is really volatile at the moment i unfortunately do know some people that have gotten their break with a junior role or an intern role but then been let go not that long afterwards like it's 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 just a really tricky time to sort of be in the industry at the moment from that point of view but Ultimately, like getting into some form of freelancing and trying to meet people and kind of just work on absolutely any sort of little project or, or even just getting into game jams. Again, I'll talk about that separately, but just, you know, something that you can get into that kind of just gets you in the development flow, gets you working on your sound design with someone else, that sort of thing. Um, like careers, like a whole freelance career is ultimately bought, built out of that loop of sort of making contacts, gaining experience, and then making more contacts and gaining an experience, etc. So um, kind of just, I want to talk a bit more about the process of just getting into the, the idea of freelancing, because it can seem kind of scary to some people to, um, you know, they focus purely on in-house roles and not on the, the, the idea of, of freelancing somewhere. So game jams like this is something that i'm really fond of like i did quite a lot of game jams when i was starting out and where i can i still love to kind of do that if i have the time um if you've never heard of a game jam it's essentially just something uh, um that you can participate in generally with other people um but sometimes by yourself even where you basically get given a set time period to create a small game project and it's never I mean, some are longer than others, but it's never very long. Normally it's like one day, two days, but I know some of them do last like maybe a week or even two weeks. Um, but yeah, a few that I did were generally sort of 24 to 48 hours. Uh, one of them was actually like an in-person one as well. I don't think it runs anymore, unfortunately, but that was up in Manchester and that was like, I stayed overnight and sort of we were there the whole time and they provided food and everything. Like it was a really nice experience. Um, but I learned so much from game jams. That was my first peek behind the curtain of like the other departments of game development. So meeting some programmers and some artists and kind of seeing their their process and kind of, um, you know, uh, what their workflow was like. And, and uh, I don't know, I just I hadn't really done anything outside of audio. So I was really fascinated to kind of see someone's art process or to see someone actually writing code at the time. You know, that was really fascinating to me. Um, so it was a really good peek into the development process. Like you work to a tight deadline generally. So it's really good kind of, um, you know, not basically giving yourself as much time in the world. You know, the idea of actually iterating on something quickly. Can you come up with sounds or music on the spot uh, that kind of fit the the brief that you've been given? Um, and mentioning brief, like you generally have like a specific prompt or direction to work to. Uh, sometimes it's maybe like a little phrase or something like that, um, or like a, a concept or a topic. Um, yeah, you'll meet fellow developers and that can sometimes lead to future audio work, you know, because ultimately the developers that are attending game jams are doing so because they want to make games. And maybe they're just making a tiny little game project that's a little bit buggy now, but maybe in a few years time, they're actually making a game that they want to ship uh, to the to the wider public. And maybe they need audio support for it. And in the time from that game jam until then, they've not met anyone else that does audio. And they remember, hey, I worked with that person that did some really nice audio for that game jam project. I wonder if they're still doing audio and they reach out. Maybe you're doing some freelance work and you've got time to work with them. You know, that's there's there's kind of like um, ways that things roll into each other. You know, sometimes that can snowball a little bit. The more people that you meet, the more game jams you do. It also gives you content for your portfolio, for your showreel, that kind of thing. It's just all around a, a good experience, like of meeting people and also getting practice in what you're doing, you know, which is great. Uh, a bit about networking. So I understand that, um, you know, and it was for me as well, like, networking can be really difficult for some people and for a lot of us i think you know introverted people find networking really difficult um neurodiverse people can find it networking really difficult uh, i struggled a lot with social anxiety when i was starting out and especially back when i was networking sort of um you know i mean i still do now but when networking in that entry level kind of position i was the only woman in the room you know there was like 30 40 50 plus uh, men in the room and that was really daunting for me like being sort of only like 22 or uh, or 23 at the time to walk into a room with not only people I didn't know but not even to have uh, any one of the same gender in that room you know that was kind of quite overwhelming but I started going with a friend that kind of made the process a lot easier and then 
there were often the same people going to the same meetups. So after a while, I started to then make friends at those meetups. And eventually I started to feel more comfortable going alone because I knew that there would always be someone that I knew. Um, and as we got to know each other, like we would still talk like as groups, we would have like a, a Facebook chat or a WhatsApp chat, that kind of thing, um, you know, where I would know in advance if they were going and that sort of thing. Um, but yeah, I mean, also a shout out that I never really had any sort of uh, negative experience in terms of like prejudice or not being welcomed or not being accepted, especially as the, as the only woman, like everyone I met was always absolutely lovely, so supportive, so incredible. Um, so that kind of really helped me get with that confidence of kind of going back and wanting to go back because I was making friends and everyone was really nice. So I think if you've never been to a meetup, like some people also think that they're kind of very formal, but they're often not. They're often very laid back. They're generally in bars and pubs. Uh, you know, people just chat openly in groups. It's often very relaxed. People are there to kind of just hang out with their friends, which is really cool. Um, the important thing is like remembering that a lot of you are obviously in the same boat, uh, especially if you're all sort of starting out. Like every time you go to a meetup, there's always going to be someone there who for them it's their first ever meetup. So generally just walking into to, up to the crowd and saying like, oh, hey, is this the game audio meetup? That's generally enough to just break the ice. And then people are always going to be kind of welcoming enough to be like, hey, yeah, it is like, who, what's your name? Like, what do you do? You know, that kind of thing that that already gets kind of things things going. So, um, yeah, there in terms of the kinds of people that I would choose to hang out with game audio people are always top of my list because they're always really friendly they're always really laid back and uh, and just really supportive uh, and it's really cool um but yeah like obviously the value of networking uh when you're starting out for me it was about just making friends but also just learning from people that had experience so I had a lot of really great conversations from people that are already working in the industry talking about their journey um, their experience like any advice that they had um, getting feedback on things like a, a show reel or sort of uh, my music uh, as it was back then that kind of thing um, that was really valuable but also like networking like can lead to job opportunities like word of mouth is still the most powerful hiring path uh, when it comes to freelance work so when I say networking it's not necessarily just audio meetups but maybe conventions or maybe stuff that's not audio specific um, but is you know game development uh, as a whole you know anything that you can go to where you can basically have the opportunity to meet people game jams are technically networking because you're going there you're kind of meeting people you're sharing about what you do that sort of thing like the more people you know the more friends you're going to make the more kind of uh relationships that you form uh like both friendships and like working relationships uh the more trust that you'll build the more people will get to know you and therefore kind of think of you if they're then chatting to someone else that needs like something like audio doing you may not know someone that themselves is hiring but that person might know someone else that's hiring and they might think of you and recommend you that sort of thing um but, you know, like if you're struggling to find hired work in a freelance capacity, like still be doing some practice or learning study, like maybe reach out to some fellow audio folks. Like, again, I've mentioned the Airwiggles audio challenges, but just anything online that you can participate in or do together. Uh, something that I did when I was starting out was even just going around to a friend's house and we got like a, a little Unreal project going and like experimented with like syncing stuff up to animations um, and we recorded like our own footsteps and that kind of thing like that was just a really fun thing to do together we were learning we were learning about Unreal we were learning about recording our own stuff um, uh, learning about using wires you know all of that was just like really cool to do together and like really good uh, practice and um, just general sort of motivation and support of each other Social media, like being present on social media doesn't come natural to everyone. And like, for me, I still find it strange, like the idea of marketing yourself. Like, I think it's a weird transition to go from something that you're just kind of really like, uh, just enjoy doing and, and 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 really passionate about to something that you actually need to make money from like that can that can feel like a really weird a thing to take something from pure uh, pure enjoyment and kind of pure pure fun to like transactional you know like obviously you still do it because you love it but the idea of having to kind of like market yourself as a product or a business you know that can feel really strange uh, particularly when you're starting out but there are more relaxed ways and social ways that you can build a presence online. Things like this are fantastic because they're just getting people out there, meeting each other, sharing a bit about what they do, maybe posting their show reels or posting like uh, because maybe they're looking for work and they're kind of just making making connections like that's awesome. And it's a much more kind of relaxed and enjoyable way of kind of 
promoting yourself like ultimately we're all here to learn and to make friends but subconsciously the more people that are getting to know your name and getting to know what you do uh, that can work in your favor when it comes to sort of finding opportunities in the future um and are there ways that you can also build your profile whilst helping other people you know so there's obviously a whole bunch of you in here that may have never heard of or met me before but if i ever go to a meetup and i'm there and you're there you might remember me from this talk and then that's a point of connection and chatting to each other like that breaks the ice you know stuff like that i absolutely love that when i kind of meet someone at a meetup and they and either I already know them or vice versa. And you can be like, oh, hey, I really enjoyed that talk that you did, or I really enjoyed that podcast that I heard you on, or I really love that article that you wrote. Um, that's really nice if you can kind of already have a, a topic that you can chat to someone about, that sort of thing. Um, and ultimately, like no matter how early you are in your game audio journey, there's always someone that's earlier on than you are. So just because you may have only been doing it for sort of, I don't know, six months, doesn't mean that you can't help someone that hasn't started yet or has only been doing it for one month. You know, don't feel like you have to get to sort of, a, you know, a principal level or a senior level or a director level to already be helping other people. Like at any point in your journey, you can be kind of connecting and, and helping one another. Um. And like a bit about like my journey, like when I was starting out, like I had a really busy kind of few years kind of getting into the industry. Like I was going to a lot of audio meetups, um, you know, sort of the Game Audio uh, North, as it was called back then, but Game Audio Nexus now, like those meetups, the London Audio Drinks. Um, I mentioned like the scholarship I got to go to GDC. That was with like nine other incredible women that I got to go. Like that was a, an incentive for women in games. Um, that was awesome. Uh, I met like the, so many lovely people out at GDC um, and with like the um, the carousel con, like people giving audio talks and stuff like that was an absolute blast. Taking part in game jams um, and going to develop, you know, like basically anything that I could do, I was trying to do to meet people, to learn from people, to make friends, um, you know, just it, it kind of just consumed my life in a really positive way, you know, and I was like, I was trying to practice still in my spare time um, and um, like also sometimes just occasionally like emailing people like just politely like for a bit of advice. Uh, some of the people that I reached out to back then became regular mentors for me and like I, I'm so grateful to that to this day you know and um, that was really really uh, valuable for me and I learned a lot if I hadn't had kind of uh, at least uh, the confidence to email them in the first place then there was there was a lot of information I would have missed out on or if I hadn't gone to sort of that audience meet up you know there were a lot of friends I would have missed out on making that kind of thing um, and ultimately I'm not saying like you have to go and do all of these things but I felt like doing all of these things kind of worked in my favor in terms of my personal growth my professional growth that kind of thing um, and ultimately I was still trying to juggle all this alongside doing my degree course and working a part-time job and that sort of thing like it was a lot of hard work but that hard work really did pay off so just a kind of a few things to remember um, like I have said, like, obviously it's competitive, but just try and do your best to like do be, stay motivated. Um, you know, it's, I think sometimes when you apply for a job uh, and especially if you're not kind of in in the scene or you're not comfortable going out and networking and meeting other people, it's really easy to feel like you're the only person that's applied for a job. And then when you're not successful, that can then feel really personal. Like you don't really have visibility of the other potentially hundreds of people that have applied for a job. And that can then be like a really big hit to your self-esteem when you're not successful. Um, but it's trying to remember that it's not necessarily a case of you not being suitable, but in that batch of candidates, maybe someone else was slightly more suitable. Um, and an example is like our, our composer, Chloe, you know, she applied for the internship two years in a row. The first time she applied, she was in the top five. She had a really strong application and interview. Um, but our now sound designer at the time, uh, Shadrach, was just a slightly stronger candidate at the time. And it would have been really easy for Chloe to go, you know what, maybe I'm not cut out for this and walk away. But she came back the next year. She had an improved portfolio. She had learned more. She had worked on a couple of her own little game projects. Um, she really showed that initiative, that growth. And she was easily our strongest candidate that year. So the important thing is like just to try and not give up at the first hurdle because there might be a lot of hurdles. And sometimes you really get tested with trying to stay motivated and trying to keep going. But it's just absolutely doing your best um, to stay, stay motivated. And I think for me, at least, like that was when the game audio community really shone because there were other people in the same boat, other people that could support me and that we could listen to each other. We could chat about it. We could rant about it, you know, anything like just having that kind of network of new friends that I'd found was really helpful with me learning, but also with me just kind of staying sane and staying motivated. Um, 
keep practicing like keep building on your skills like i've talked a lot about sort of uh trying to get into game jam freelance work that that kind of thing like just keep keep doing keep creating audio you know just like don't don't give up just because you've not had success or don't kind of just sit there waiting for the next opportunity like just just literally keep going and keep practicing keep getting better job rejections are completely normal uh some people may only have one some may have two, some may have hundreds, you know, that's completely normal. Um, and I think it's important, you know, with every rejection that you get to think about why you might have had that rejection, you know, not kind of just brushing off as like, oh, well, I guess someone was maybe just a bit better than me, but I'm still great. You know, it's still having a realistic expectation of like, okay, well, maybe could my show will be better? Um, could my co cover letter have come across better? Could I have interviewed better if you got to the interview stage? Um I think sometimes a useful thing is like if you have applied for a job and you weren't successful, but you see who did get the job, be it on like social media, have a look at their website, have a look at their showreel. Like, is there anything that they did much differently uh, or, or sort of much better? You know, is there anything that you could kind of learn from that? maybe even consider reaching out to them maybe you already know them and kind of just politely ask them like uh, a few questions about whether they felt like there was anything that they felt stood out in their showreel that kind of thing like sharing advice and information is just awesome so um yeah obviously most job roles won't be able to give you feedback if you're unsuccessful so the important thing is to try and try and understand your own feedback, you know, trying to critically analyze your own application. And it's also useful again, to get advice and, uh, from other people and feedback from other people in this situation, but trying to just critically kind of look at your own work and like what areas for improvement that you might have, or whether there is something maybe you didn't come across very well in the interview because you were incredibly nervous. And again, that's completely normal. But if you're nervous to the point where you maybe froze up and didn't even know what to say or couldn't give any answers, then obviously that would maybe impact your chance so you know those kinds of things just reflecting about whether there's anything that you could maybe do differently um i've already talked a lot about learning from those that are in the industry um so just a few more things like there's nothing stopping you from working in game audio and i mean that in the sense of it may not immediately be paid work or it may not immediately be a lot of work but maybe it's uh it's a game jam or maybe it's doing a project with some friends um you know like there's absolutely nothing stopping you from doing it right now the only thing is that you might not be doing it maybe in-house or in like a full-time position but that's fine like it doesn't mean that you can't be actually getting out there and still trying to do it and trying to practice like games are being developed all the time all day every Every day there's people making games you know trying to get out there like connects with independent developers or sort of uh, indie dev groups um again like through game jams like anything that kind of gets you connected with people that are working on projects that kind of thing um getting involved with meetups uh going to conventions where possible like if this is something that you feel comfortable doing there are still ones that are virtual even just being present in the chat here even if you're not talking in the chat like you've still showed up you're still here you're still learning you're still doing what you can to get better like that's so important like just don't don't lose that spark you know just keep going just keep learning um and maybe at some point you'll if you feel a bit more comfortable if you get a bit more confidence you know maybe you will then start chat talking in chat or kind of go into a meetup to to to, to meet someone you know like anything that you can do is better than nothing basically um and enjoy the process you know like it's a wonderful community like make friends be curious like just keep learning and as we've always said always be recording you know just kind of immerse yourself as much as possible and kind of just enjoy the ride as much as you can and just a final takeaway like to anyone that's in hiring positions please hire more entry-level folks where you can like we have talked already about that the industry is incredibly volatile. Companies don't always get headcount or approval to take on entry level. But if you have the option to do an internship or if you have the option to take on someone that's entry level, it's so valuable. I literally wouldn't have gotten into the industry without my internship. Um, and, you know, that the same, as I've already said, is for half of our team at X interns, you know, like it's such a valuable way of bringing people in. So, uh, yeah, please do it where possible. Um, and that is it. Like there's a couple of my links and my email address. Sorry, I didn't answer the chat or any questions like throughout. Um, I just knew that it would kind of throw, throw me off if I was trying to read it whilst also reading my own notes and kind of talking. Um, but yeah, if we have time, like I'm happy to answer any questions uh, if they're there um, or alternatively, like I'll be in the in the hangout chat afterwards if there are if there are any questions that people think of later. Um, and on top of that, if you think of um, them after today, like feel free to email me. Like I'm always happy to do my best to help. So, oh, my throat's sore now. Hopefully, hopefully that was helpful. <laughs>
it's really hard when you've not got any like voice feedback and you're just but yeah thank you for posting in the chat i'm, I'm really glad it was uh it was useful um cool we've got a bit of extra time i can try and scroll back and see if there are any questions or oh greg's doing the absolute lord's work of of summarizing them for me um let's have a look so hang on oh my god they're already disappearing <laughs> uh so uh from oh, and it's gone and it's gone and it's gone. it just keeps flicking up i can't keep trying it. i'll try to scroll up a bit higher so that it doesn't disappear um what's the chance of getting an internship when you're over the age of 35 um just as high as anyone else uh, i wouldn't like to think that there's any age prejudice at any company there certainly isn't at rare uh, we had applicants from all age brackets um beyond way beyond 35 as well that were looking at an internship and it's not about what age you are um it's about you know where you are in your audio journey and whether we feel that the uh, internship will be beneficial for you you know whether we feel like you're doing your best to kind of do it already and this is your helping hand to get in and then do it in a, in a more professional capacity that's kind of our only criteria um and interestingly we had some people that because of covid they had actually decided on a career change you know they'd maybe been furloughed um and they'd had time at home to sort of actually really think about what they wanted to do for a living and realize they weren't working in a job that they enjoyed and they were having a crack at doing audio because they kind of discovered that actually that's been my dream job all along and that's awesome you know like if if the show reel and the application and everything else is still strong it really doesn't matter what age you are so uh, another question, how we short, shortlist the candidates from 10 down to one who gets the job? I assume all 10 had strong qualifications. And so what criteria do you use in these final interviews? Um, I think that is a bit of a tricky one because ultimately it's it's born out of a, a discussion from the entire team. And um, yeah, obviously we, we get people get through to interview stage because um, of, of their kind of application and their show reel. But in those final kind of shortlist moments, we are still talking about those things. We are still talking about um, how their their cover letter and their CV came across, like how their showreel came across. Um, but I think at the interview stage, it really um, is about kind of their soft skills, about how they got on with the team um, and sort of um, what answers that they gave to questions, you know? So if, uh, if they could really kind of be able to share why they wanted the internship, what they wanted to get out of it. That was kind of a really important thing. Um, ultimately, the interview like isn't a, it's not a technical interview. You know, we're not like really quizzing you on sort of like, um, you know, what it is that, you know, but it's kind of just a general vibe. Um, and, you know, we take into account um sort of neurodiversity as well or, or people's nerves as well you know if people show up and they're they're incredibly nervous or they they struggle maybe with um being able to sort of like especially in sort of the later interviews that are more of a group setting like that can be really overwhelming but you get enough of a vibe about um someone's answers that they're able to give or ha how they are with the team and with the person to kind of at least um be able to have enough insight to kind of make a decision like it's quite it's quite a hard thing we don't have like a set criteria it's kind of just um how we felt they showed up like sort of what their application was like what we feel that they would get out of the internship so we did have an element of criteria about we had some applicants that were actually already working in the industry, uh, still at entry level, but they've already kind of gotten their break. They're already in the industry so that the internship is meant to be about giving someone that break. So we don't necessarily want to take someone out of a job that they're already in and then put them in another job. That doesn't feel very fair. The whole point is that we're trying to give someone that break when they haven't got a job in the first place. So there's kind of a lot of different uh, factors at play. Um, hopefully that that was helpful and not too much of a waffle. Um, are there any more questions? Uh, do you have advice for those that would have difficulties moving locations for jobs or internships? Uh, that's a really tricky one because I think, especially for internships, a lot of companies expect you to be on site. And if your only internship opportunity requires you to move to another country, that I think that's really just a decision that you need to make about how you feel about doing that. Um, 
because unfortunately it can be unavoidable. And for me, I didn't have to move very far, but I still had to move three hours away from my family and all the friends that I'd ever had. That was a really difficult thing for me to kind of go, do I want to basically uproot and, and move away from my entire life for, for a 12 month experience that, that may not lead to anything? You know, that was kind of what I was thinking at the time. I didn't know that I would get kept on after the internship. You know, um, I had to kind of weigh that up. and. Yeah, obviously it was my dream job. So for me personally, I was like, no questions asked. I'm, I'm going to go for it. But if you're applying for a job later in life and maybe you've got kids, maybe you've got a partner, maybe you've got a house that you would then have to sell. That's really difficult. And I think maybe then it's trying to see about is freelancing something that you could do, something that allows you to work at home? Is there any negotiation whatsoever that could be had with the company to allow you to work remotely? Um, could you potentially work hybrid so that you could work partly from home and then only come to the office part time? Uh, there's a lot of things that can sometimes be ha had uh, in terms of a discussion, um, but obviously some job requirements like for the internship for example we unfortunately were only able to take on applicants from the UK because of visa complications we weren't able to take someone over just for 12 months and get a visa approved for that so um we there were a couple I think that we tried to consider um someone applied from Canada I think and based on Canada's visa rules and the UK there was a way that they would maybe be able to do it so we were doing our best to try and accommodate that where possible but um yeah for, for the 12 month internship it was focusing on on kind of uh, local candidates which is unfortunate um but yeah like the idea of moving can be really difficult um and I think if it's if it's something that your relocation is going to affect other people, it's maybe about having those those conversations with each other and thinking about what that job opportunity is and kind of how much do you want it? You know, like, are you content doing what you're doing at the moment or is this absolutely with all your body and soul what you want to be doing with your life? You know, I think that's the only way that you can really gauge if it's kind of worth doing. Um, one thing I find hard is applying to jobs where I might be a bit off the requirements, but also might have a decent chance to make it to later stages of the process. I'm not sure how to frame the question, but if you have any thoughts on how to approach that, I'd be super appreciative. Um, yeah, I mean, I mentioned that uh, kind of earlier in the presentation is like, don't necessarily be put off by job requirements. Like, I mean, don't go applying for like a senior sound designer role if you've barely kind of done any sound design obviously but if you see an internship that maybe says like um you need x amount of experience or maybe you see a junior role that says you already need a year of experience but you've only maybe got eight months you know like or, or six months or whatever like still give it a go like the worst thing is that your application can get rejected you know but if your application comes across well or your showreel really stands out um then then go for it you know you never know what luck you're going to have and um for me when i applied to to rare like um i didn't um i didn't really know like how to stand out i kind of just did my best about kind of showing what i'd been doing and kind of just trying to get them to understand like I'm doing absolutely everything I can here and like this is the opportunity that I'm hoping for to get into the industry you know it's like I taught myself uh, as much as possible and like you know all of those kinds of things so um yeah I wouldn't let kind of the black and white print put you off um but yeah I mean don't apply for like a sound design role if you're just a composer that kind of thing but if there's if there's there's, there's always some flexibility in the job requirements is kind of what um what what I'm, I'm trying to say um yeah uh sorry i'm just gonna have a look if there's any more questions while we've got a few more minutes um bit of a bummer question but what if you were laid off and you've been ground down to the point where you don't even personally enjoy the craft anymore i think that's really hard like the like i feel demotivated sometimes even though i've still got my job you know because it crushes me to see friends that are getting laid off uh, it crushes me to see studios that are getting shut down like this is a really unprecedented kind of time in the industry obviously layoffs have always been a thing in games but to the scale that we've had them like it's it, it really is unprecedented and I think without going into too much detail there is a big overarching kind of philosophy of like there was a hiring boom during COVID that we're now suffering from because Games were making a massive profit. They started hiring a bunch of people. They got overexcited. They hired too many people. And now they're realizing that profits aren't as high as they thought. Shareholders aren't as happy as they thought. And now they're trying to cut costs and that's resulting in layoffs. Those layoffs are going to happen. Those teams are then going to struggle because they've not got enough people. And then we're going to start seeing the trickle up again of them having to hire those people back because they can't physically make the games they need to make without the people that they've got, you know. So 
it's a bit of we're kind of in the dip and i'm hoping that there's going to be another peak um but i don't know how long that's going to take you know that's that's really not my area of expertise but i think for me if i was in that situation and i had lost my job and who knows maybe in a year's time i would have like we really have no idea what's going to happen in the industry but if i was in that situation i would just be doing my best to kind of bring myself back to my roots of what brought me there in the first place and maybe that wouldn't be doing sound design straight away maybe that would be me going back to playing music or writing a bit of music because i don't do a lot of that anymore maybe that would be me going back to a bit of that and just trying to create for me and not necessarily create for a job application or something like that maybe it's going back out to networking events just to kind of meet people just to chat or connecting with people online and just going, you know what, I'm just, I'm really feeling low at the moment and I could just do with chatting to someone. Um, I think that's really valuable as well. Um, just talking about it, you know, if you ever need to email me, I'll do my best to kind of like to chat and we can, you know, we can, we can set up a call and we can chat it over, you know, like, um, like, yeah, I just think trying to get, if you've got friends in the industry, trying to connect with them and just trying to sort of get back to what you felt gave you that joy in the first place, you know? Um, yeah, it's, it's really hard. There's no kind of concrete advice that I can give there. Like, I'm sorry that you're going, going through such a difficult situation, but, um, yeah, I think as with a lot of things, things will eventually get better. Um, and hopefully there'll be other opportunities that come your way that kind of pull you out, um, of that kind of that dip. Um, how does the team view large gaps in employment history slash career progression? As we know, life sometimes gets in the way, especially over the pandemic years. Do you think gaps can be harmful towards applications? Um, in my opinion, no, as long as you can show that you were maybe um, doing uh, still doing your your craft during that time, like on a personal basis. You know, I think if someone had been out of employment for a few years, but they were still kind of dabbling in in their area of choice uh, in their spare time, that kind of shows me at least that they've not given up on it. But maybe there's a personal reason why they had to give up on it you know like um i think i would i personally wouldn't discard someone's cv or even really pay much attention to a gap in their cv if their show reel is good you know like the show reel is really like the 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 main thing that we focus on is like how how good is the show reel when everything else is kind of secondary to that so um for me personally i think as long as you can still show up well with your your cover letter and your show reel that kind of thing like i personally don't view a gap as being harmful um, but obviously, this is all just my my um, personal opinion. Um, if we don't meet all the re all of the requirements in the job spec, is that something that should be addressed in the cover letter? Um, I don't necessarily think so. You can address that if you want, but you're essentially just highlighting it. So unless you've got a good kind of reason to give, I think you you maybe could like just. I think sometimes like some companies have quite a, a brutal HR kind of process where some stuff just gets automatically filtered out if it doesn't tick certain things. So it could actually be worth mentioning just to try and uh, tackle that filtering process. Um, to my mind, I don't think we have that uh, at Rare unless it was, like I say, for the location issue that we had, like we had to eliminate some because of visa reasons. But yeah, I think you can maybe mention it and just say like, um, you know, I know I don't have the maybe the three years of experience that you're asking for but i feel that i make up for this in uh you know what 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 i know what i'm capable of you know obviously not those exact words but you know something to that effect you know um kind of showing why your your experience is is equivalent to though like why your personal experience is equivalent to the years of professional experience or something you know something like that um as a look um yeah, that's not necessarily a question, but coming from the freelance world, uh, the whole junior mid senior thing is really ambiguous. Like, I'd love to talk a bit more about that. I don't know if I have time, but um, yeah, I will. I'll potentially put something about that in the hangout chat afterwards about kind of differentiating and that growth process uh, through the ranks. Because yeah, I do understand that if you've never worked in a company like that, can feel really, uh, really confusing. Um, uh, sorry, I'm just trying to see if there are any. Uh, if you're not having much luck with a succession of job applications and there's not anything obvious you're doing wrong, plus the companies you're applying to don't have time to give feedback, what's the best approach to pinpointing what the issue is? At that point, I would be trying to reach out to other people for feedback. I'd be asking friends, um, posting maybe online on Airwiggles, on LinkedIn, that kind of thing, posting my showreel, um, just doing absolutely everything I could to get feedback on what I'm doing because maybe you're not viewing what you're doing uh, kind of critically enough. Um, 
maybe you'll the feedback you'll get is actually you're doing every you know i've had some people that have reached out for mentorship and i've looked through their stuff and i'm like honestly you're doing absolutely everything you can be doing um so the only thing you can do is keep going and keep applying because like i said my example with chloe and shadrach like chloe Chloe's first application was great. It's just that Shadrach was a little bit stronger at the time in terms of how he came across in his interview and sort of what his application was like and what his showreel is like, that kind of thing. So it wasn't that Chloe wasn't qualified to do the job. She absolutely was. And we would have loved to have taken on both of them. Um, but in that year, she was just ever so slightly, didn't kind of stick out quite as much as, as Shadrach did. So she applied the next year and then she had success. So I think timing is also a big factor as well. You know, it's kind of that whole, what is it? Like luck is when preparation meets opportunity or I don't even, I don't know if I've butchered that, but yeah, something like that, essentially like the opportunities will come along and if you're prepared, then hopefully they'll, the two will connect and you'll kind of get your break. Um, since sound design internships are generally more common than composition internships, would you recommend switching focus to sound design for someone who's been focusing on building up a composer portfolio? Only if you're genuinely enthused about being a sound designer and you're happy being committing your career to being a sound designer. You know, if you genuinely love both and you feel qualified at doing both and you would be happy working in both full time, then consider the switch. Um, but if you're actually like, no, my heart is with being a, a composer, trying to do your best to stick with that, looking for some freelance work, just trying to network, just trying to connect with as many people as possible, do game jams, like all the things I've talked about, just trying to get out there like, and keep, keep building that portfolio, keep making those connections. Unfortunately, composition does tend to be more of a freelance kind of role. Um, composer roles tend to be more with AAA companies for which you already need to have quite an impressive uh, back catalogue, you know, credit lists, um, you know, profile, that kind of thing. Um, but, or, you know, composer opportunities do occasionally come up at entry level. Um, so, yeah, I think the takeaway, if you're really passionate about music, stick with it and, and do what you can. Don't switch just because you think that will get you in the door, because I don't think that leads to a particularly rewarding uh, career path. Um, are there just too many games that public interest can't support? There's only so much entertainment that people have time and money for. So it ends up being an interesting financial dichotomy holistically. Yeah, I mean, I... I don't I think the, the games industry can end up too saturated um, and I'll only kind of give a brief thing on this because obviously it's straying away a bit from the topic. But um, yeah, I don't think the games industry can end up too. it can end up too saturated with the same kinds of games. But I don't think it can end up too saturated in terms of amount of games because people have lots of different interests. I personally dabble with lots of different games every week, different games as a service or indie games or whatever. You know, I play a whole bunch of different genres. Personally, I can never have enough games, but the thing that drains me a little bit is when I see time and time again, the same kind of games coming out. So, um, you know, the massive trend of like, um, you know, kind of, uh, uh, like battle royales that we had for a while you know um or at the moment like a lot of uh monetization driven like um games as a service and and sort of competitive shooters that kind of thing like the same kind of thing all the time can be quite draining from that point of view um but yeah in terms of number and variety of games like yeah the more the merrier in my opinion um i think we're mostly through all the questions Uh, yeah, so, sorry if I've also I've just seen about the transcription. Sorry if I've spoken too fast as well. Like I do, especially like if anyone for English isn't their first language, I, I do speak a bit quickly. So I'm sorry if anything's been lost in, in translation. Um, but yeah, I'm also like if there's particular things that you want to know more on or you want to ask questions on, like feel free to contact me as well. Um, I don't think I've missed any questions. Hopefully not. Um, I don't know if we have any time to answer any final ones or if we should wrap up. Uh, yeah, we can go to the Hangout space if not. Um, I'll do one last one. Are there many entry level opportunities for audio implementation or programming specifically, or would it be better to pair it with sound design as well? There are entry level roles for audio programming that I've seen. Audio implementation is kind of more of a technical sound design role, but can also be factored into a traditional sound design role. So at Rare, we actually handle all of our own our own implementation, you know, we handle everything personally from asset creation all the way through to implementation um, in WISE. And then more recently, I've also been taking on the programming implementation as well. And my boss and I both do that and we kind of share the tasks for that. I've really gotten into C++ and kind of coding uh, implementation. So, um, yeah, we our team is basically 
uh, I, I would say a one man band, but you know, a seven man band, a seven person band of, uh, of folks that kind of handle everything from the asset creation all the way through to, um, yeah, through through to the the engine implementation. Um, so yeah, there are opportunities specifically for programming if you want to do that. But if you're more interested in actual implementation using wires, using the game engine, that would potentially be more the realm of, of technical sound design. Um, yeah, hopefully that was helpful. Thank you so much for all sticking around as well. Like I've held your attention for a long time, so I'm, I'm really appreciative of you uh, of you all sticking around and asking questions and get, saying such lovely things. Um, yeah, I think we're done. I think we're wrapped up.